So we're going to um, move in now to um, our final module, which is focused on um, Canada and uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and Canada's role in facilitating uh, nuclear abolition. Um, I think, Caesar, we're going to start with you and then, and then move on to Julie. Um, and then we're going to have uh, hopefully 15 minutes, uh, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less um, at the end for more Q&A, um, where we'll invite some more questions. And if we get through those, then we can uh, perhaps address some of the ones that have already been posed, um, which have been excellent once again. So thanks so much. Uh, and Caesar, please take it away. Thanks, Kelsey, and thanks, Julie, for those latest comments, and and thank you, everybody, for for the comments on the on the on the chat function and on the Q and A. I'm, I'm as Julie was speaking, I was reviewing them. Just excellent questions and, and difficult questions, admittedly, uh, but uh, these are the questions I think that we need to be asking uh, <clears throat> about the trajectory, about the solutions, about the the assumptions that underpin some of our assessments and 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 the implications thereof. Um, and, and we're going to bring a little bit home to Canada. And Julie already mentioned Canada a little bit, and we may well continue mentioning Ukraine. But, uh, but of course, uh, we're in Canada, and, and, and a key priority for Project Plowshares, a key interlocutor has long been, you know, the Canadian government uh, in terms of, of, of asking that question. Where, you know, is Canada pulling its weight? And if so, in which direction are we doing all we can? Uh, and, and are Canadian actions really reflecting the, the gravity of the threat of the nuclear weapons threat and the urgency of finding effective solutions to, 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 to defuse this threat and to move away from, from escalation. And, and, and for us, uh, for a long time, the premise to this question is that indeed Canada can and must do more to achieve nuclear, the abolition of nuclear weapons. Uh, Canada has made some important contributions to the, uh, to the, to the debate. Uh, there's also some more questionable positions. Uh, but in the end, we are convinced that Canada can and must do more. To achieve the abolition of, the, <clears throat> of nuclear weapons, and our uh, and this assumption is founded on certain objective attributes that Canada possesses. I mean, Julie was 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 just mentioning a, a, a role as bridge builder, and 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 that's a, a natural role for Canada with you know well earned re reputation as a, as an honest broker and in these processes, uh, a, a very clear history of, of humanitarian disarmament as we now refer to it, but just uh, just uh, of of, of uh, norm making with the based on humanitarian consideration. Just we're marking 25 years since uh, since the Landmines Treaty uh, in which Canada had a protagonist role, and and so so there. Really Really is a, a, a collection of, of attributes. Not to mention that we're an active player in the nuclear energy industry. That we're party uh, to the to the MPT. That we're uh, that, that we're members of the Conference on Disarmament. That we're part to the part of the, of NATO. That we're part of the G7. That we're part of the G20. And that we have well earned credibility as an inter on the international stage. So it's 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 not only necessary for Canada to step up and 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 do more on on, on the abolition of nuclear weapons, but it's a shame if it doesn't you know because it's a waste because we have all, all these attributes in which, in which Canada could really have uh, play a role now I think in the context of nuclear weapons we need to to recognize that the the risks and these thorny questions predate the invasion of Ukraine yes the invasion of Ukraine has exacerbated a lot of these tensions and has has brought the the risk of nuclear weapons use to the fore but uh, but these these questions predate and that some of the tensions and some of the struggles of the of the international community related to nuclear disarmament predate and may likely uh, uh, exist even after a, a negotiated settlement is reached in the Ukraine crisis, unless and until nuclear weapons are eliminated, there will be that basic level of an existing nuclear weapons threat. So in the context of what can Canada do, we, we need to recognize that a key, a key, uh, attribute from the, from the ones I've mentioned has to do with membership in a, in an overtly nuclear military alliance and that is that is a, a, from our perspective a problematic situation and whereby some some non-nuclear members of nato walk a certain duality 
in the international system, whereby on the one hand, in forums such as the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, they present themselves as responsible international actors that have foregone nuclear weapons. But simultaneously, and it's not a secret, overtly, they are part of a, of, a, of a military alliance that has an overt and explicit policy of nuclear deterrence. They participate in the nuclear weapons planning group, et cetera. And, I, and we, we, we feel that therein lies a, lies a, 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 a contradiction. There is an oversimplified view sometimes uh, in terms of the nuclear disarmament landscape that, of, uh, that there are generally two camps. You know, the few that have nuclear weapons and are obstinately clinging to their arsenals and the rest of the international community sort of pulling in the same direction for nuclear abolition. The reality is a bit more nuanced and there is a very critical third camp and that is that includes Canada and that is, this is the nuclear dependent states. And this includes several uh, states that even though they ha they directly have foregone nuclear weapons, their policies and doctrines uh, are, are in many ways more closely aligned with their nuclear armed allies than with the rest of the international community that is pulling for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Indeed, their decisions in terms of policy processes, normative process, treaty, re treaty regimes, old and new, their decisions on how they engage with them are more aligned with nuclear armed states than with the, the, the rest of the international community, including the reluctance to, to embrace the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, including having having positions in, 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 in at the MPT that, that that are close to their to their nuclear armed allies, including endorsing the, the strategic concept of NATO and 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 including the rejection of of statements uh, that that uh, that speak to the aspiration of of never using nuclear weapons again under any circumstances. So so Canada is in a, in a, finds itself in a peculiar position. However, with Canada also, you know, its, it's the stated goal is the abolition of nuclear weapons, the pursuit of a, of a world without nuclear weapons. And, uh, <clears throat> and we feel that, that in, in line with that, I mean, in, in line with, with a sort of a, a coherent pursuit of that goal, there is more than Canada can do. So I will mention a few, a few, just a, a, few, a few general ideas of where, where positive Canadian action uh, might happen and we would love to see. So first of all, I mean, there's a, the general notion of making nuclear disarmament a priority. That sounds like self-evident and or, or stating the obvious, but, but you know, if, if, uh, if uh, to pursue a policy goal, it needs to be prioritized. And, and, and even though uh, Canada, uh, uh, I can't speak for the government, I feel they might say that nuclear disarmament is a priority. Uh, I must say from a civil society perspective, it doesn't fully feel like a priority. I, 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 I can't recall when nuclear disarmament has been, ha, uh, and the pursuit of our goal without nuclear weapons has been, has been raised at the Minister of Foreign Affairs level or at the Prime Minister's level uh, in, in recent years. You know, perhaps there, there have been references to to denouncing Iran or to or to or to uh, rejecting resolutions about uh, Israel's nuclear weapons at the, at the at the General Assembly very very recently, or about denying, denouncing Putin. But these are very specific policy positions that are intertwined with politics and with NATO solidarity, etc. But nuclear disarmament as a pursuit, as a global pursuit that Canada will prioritize, I think the, that that we have seen very little of. And I would dare. Uh, think that if if uh, people in the know at, 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 at political science departments at Canadian universities were asked to rank top foreign follow uh, top five say uh, foreign policy priorities for the Canadian government I'd be very surprised if nuclear disarmament made it I, I I don't think there's a perception that nuclear disarmament is a priority for the Canadian government and 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 I think we have a problem there um so that's something that Canada can do, you know, just imagine if the prime minister, you know, uttered the words nuclear disarmament, that in itself, uh, I think, would not only be consequential, but at the same time, I think we need to realize it's relatively low hanging fruit. You know, the table the, the, is served there for, 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 for Canada to, to take this and, 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 and really uh, exercise a, a leadership role. Uh, there is a, a 2018 recommendation from the House of Commons Standing Committee on National Defense that specifically asked the Canadian government, and I'll read, uh, that Canada take a leadership role within NATO in the work necessary for achieving the NATO goal of creating the conditions for a world 
free of nuclear weapons. So in, in other words, the, the, the Canadian government is asked to work within NATO, within NATO to create the conditions for, for a world without nuclear weapons. And I always like to remind uh, uh, people that, that, that membership in NATO does not and cannot mean exclusively acquiescence with the dictates of the United States. You know, what type of friendship or what type of alliance is that if it is understood like that? I think membership in NATO comes with agency and a sense of agency that can, as a nation, can initiate and take to fruition certain dialogues, including as mandated by our own parliament to move away from the policy of nuclear deterrence and to formulate security relationships that do not rely uh, on nuclear weapons. At the, uh, at the second meeting of states parties to the Treaty on the Prevention of Nuclear Weapons yet to be held, but we know it's going to be presided by Mexico, it would be excellent if Canada were to join as an observer. As many of you know, this was a, 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 an advocacy goal, if you will, for, for many of us, many groups uh, uh, in Canada before the first meeting of six parties to the TPNW. And we had we had high hopes that Canada would be there as an observer. We, uh, in fact, we, we would like to see Canada join the treaty. But we knew there was an avenue to be there as, as an observer. And NATO members such as Norway, Germany, the Netherlands, etc., find the pol found the political space to be there as observer. Servers. But Canada, uh, Canada did not. So, but you know, the opportunity remains open, and, and, and we really hope that Canada will be we will be able to 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 attend um, as an observer. And and finally, we 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 hope that Canada will that Canada will, in the specific context of the Ukraine crisis, really prioritize diplomacy with the view, with a specific view to diffusing escalation, to diffusing the situation and to preventing escalation that may result in, in, in the use of nuclear weapons. Julie? Um, I don't have any direct follow-up only because the things I want to talk about are going to very much overlap with the exact same things that you were saying. Um, so, I will clarify that I have three suggestions for Canada going forward within regard to nuclear weapons abolition, uh, particularly with relations to the TPNW. But I'll also include that those suggestions have uh, I've included some background information if I felt it was required. Uh, the first suggestion is international, and the last two are domestic. So suggestions that I think Canada can do at home. Um, so as you said. Uh, Canada needs to attend as an observer at the next meeting state party to the uh, TPNW, which will be occurring in New York next year from November 27th to December 1st. Uh, Canada has a year to make this decision and prepare for their attendance. I'll remind attendees and Canada that we have a long history of committing to disarmament with notable moments domestically and internationally. From Diefenbaker refusing American weapons, nuclear weapons until Lester B. Pearson caved in 1963 to the pressure, and then to Canada being the first country to willingly choose to give those U.S. nuclear weapons back from 1968 to 1984. We're also Trudeau Sr. Uh, proposed a strategy of suffocation in 1973 to ending the mounting arms race at that time to the United Nations. We also were the first country to choose to not produce nuclear weapons, even though we have the material, technology, and expert to do so. Uh, that faith has maintained itself within the global community of Canada choosing not to make nuclear weapons. That same faith has not been cannot be say, said for every country who has that capability that are not currently nuclear weapon states. Uh, we are also the first country to place all of our international transfers of nuclear materials through the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, which is a monetization and verification organization. As a reminder, Cesar also said, uh, nuclear material does not necessarily mean that it's going to be used for weapons. It's often uh, used for science and for other uh, capacities. Healthcare is another area that it can be used as well as energy. And we are often very proud to be very early supporters and continue to be supporters of the NPT. And it's a reminder that a lot of this happened during the Cold War and at the height of Cold War tension. We've done all of this without putting our NATO membership at risk. And we, of course, have been involved in other treaties as well and have often been key members and negotiators and developers of these treaties. 
One of the treaties in disarmament in general that we often point toward as our commitment to disarmament is our landmine ban treaty. Um, and so we do have a commitment and history involvement with this, uh, with this topic of disarmament in general and certainly with nuclear weapons. Additionally, in the post 9-11 world in which the status quo and security expectations shifted, we, Canada, in 2002, called on NATO members to vote in favor of a world free of nuclear weapons at the UN. 2002 was at the height of new security policies being put into place and uh, was also a remarkably tense and uncertain such a place to be for the world and our future security. Now, when Canada announced and encouraged, encouraged our NATO allies to vote yes on nuclear free world, we stood alone. And the nuclear weapon states in NATO, US, France, and UK voted no, while our other allies abstained from a vote. Former Senator and diplomat Douglas Roche commented on this moment that it was a signal of where Canada wanted to go in the future, but it was also a very lonely position to have. Canada has a history in disarmament and one that often we tout with pride. And we also need to remember our commitments to peace and security and remember who we are narratively and who we believe we are as a country. There isn't, this isn't the first time that we've made seemingly daring decisions as a nation in times of tension, and this won't be the last. And we've had to wrestle with our responsibility to NATO before, along with concerns of national security and nu the nuclear question. The difference this time is that we'll not be alone at the TPNW meeting. Our allies, Norway, Germany, Netherlands, Finland, and Sweden attended this past summer and are likely to attend again next year in the winter. Canada can go knowing that they will have friends by their side as an observer. A quote comes to mind when I think about Canada's potential attendance as an observer and in the nuclear abolition conversation in general, and it's a phrase that we've heard more than a few times over the years. The world needs more Canada. We have a unique position as a middle power narratively and historically that brings strength to the international community, one that seems to be missing from the nuclear disarmament and arms control debate. I worry that if we don't rejuvenate this belief that we can make a difference in this conversation, that will be forgotten in the conversation as leaders for the future. So we need to be brave and reach out to our allies that have already made this commitment to engaging with the TPNW and be observers at the next meeting in 2023. My second suggestion follows in relation to the last one and the suggestion is, uh, was also mentioned in capacity by Caesar as well. The House of Commons, our Canadian House of Commons, our elected representatives need to have a full discussion or debate on Canada, the TPNW and the rising nuclear tensions that we have been reintroduced to that we spoke about earlier. The rising tensions and risk that I alluded to earlier, more specifically, is the return of great power politics, in addition to the modernizing stockpiles and missile technologies, rising concerns regarding other nuclear weapon states, which are often phrased as rogue nuclear weapon states. Those are uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, so North Korea and Iran. Um, and all of these factors are mixed with mounting uncertain domestic politics, a global food crisis, global energy concerns, and anticipated recession. And this creates tensions that are remarkably uncomfortable to address any of these concerns when nuclear weapons continue to metaphorically hang over our heads, uh, particularly when that threat itself of them potentially being used uh, is could result in a multitude of global crises amplified almost immediately. Uh, we need to engage with our elected officials to encourage them to discuss the matter fully, not a footnote, but a true debate. Topics to be discussed could be as simple as reminding parliamentarians of our humanitarian commitment, our past disarmament leadership, NATO commitment, our Arctic security concerns, the North warning system and upgrades, current nuclear tensions, nuclear anxiety in the public, the NPT versus the TPNW, which should be understood as a joined goal, not as a dichotomy. Uh, global political concerns as Canada is surrounded by nuclear weapon states and also has a number of American nuclear silos at our shared border. And the list, quite frankly, is endless. Uh, but what this means is that a conversation and debate is needed in its full capacity. It shouldn't just end at NATO's own messaging. Canada, yes, is a strong ally, a founder, a deeply connected NATO. Uh, 
uh, deeply connected to NATO and all of its allies, but we are an independent state and a democratic one. A debate in its full capacity needs to occur to make a decision on what Canada's position is as a state and also whether they will attend as an observer to that next meeting in 2023 that I mentioned before. My last suggestion is about transparency in education. Uh, Canada's involvement with nuclear weapons is not removed nor new. And uh, our involvement notably goes back among, almost to the beginning, since 1943 with the Quebec Conference and subsequent agreement between the USA, Britain, and Canada in which procedures and involvement with the Manhattan Project were determined. Canada provided a number of experts, scientists and engineers to the project, as well as what is believed to be a substantial amount of nuclear fissile materials, so the materials used for nuclear weapons, most notably uranium. Uh, uranium was mined in a number of locations in Canada. Many mines that were uh, that existed were in and around indigenous reserve areas and with indigenous, indigenous miners employed. One of the linked and notable places to the Manhattan Project, specifically to the bomb dropped in Japan in 1945, was uranium from Port Radium on the Great Bear Lake in the Northwest Territories, which had affected the Dalene Gochine First Nations Dene people before it was transferred to Port Hope Refinery in Ontario and then to the numerous locations for the Manhattan Project in the U.S. For the Dene people, there has been a massive impact on their community due to their involvement with the uranium mines and specific reports of high number of residents and former miners having cancer and often them being terminal. The port radium itself also ceases to exist in large part because it is not livable. While there was a federal report, report done in 2005, the report determined that there was no clear connection between the mine and the cases, but the numbers seemed too coincidental to not have a further investigation into that situation. Regardless, Canada's involvement with any impact it had our Indigenous communities uh, on our Indigenous communities have seemed to have been swept under the rug. And for more information on this, I would highly recommend watching the documentary called Moral Awakening to learn more about this part of Canada's history of nuclear weapons and our Indigenous people. Additionally, there are approximately 700 veterans that were affected by nuclear testing and cleanup of testing sites within the Canadian Armed Forces from 1946 to 1963. I recognize that in 2006, the former Minister of National Defense, Gordon O'Connor, commissioned a report on veteran involvement with these uh, cleanups and testings done in order to prepare those soldiers during that time period for a possibility of nuclear war. This had been recognized by the government and an ex grata payment was made available of $24,000 and placed in a Canadian War Museum as memoriam. Where do these two fit in the last suggestion? Again, it's education and transparency. The public needs to know about its own history. The testing done on our soldiers, the fact that Canada housed American weapons and gave them back voluntarily and by choice when many other countries did not, and our disarmament history, but also the transparency about the fact that we were involved in the Manhattan Project and that it has impacted and continues to impact a number of our Indigenous communities as a result. It is only through remembering the good and the bad of our past that we can work toward the future that is not only possible, but also one that places Canada as a leader once more. Canada can be a bridge builder, as I mentioned before, and was backed also by Caesar uh, between our security allies and our humanitarian supporters. Article six of the TPNW looks at victims assistance and environmental remedi remediation. It is what makes the treaty so unique amongst all of the nuclear disarmament regimes. This is a natural place for Canada to begin to look at how the TPNW may work with our country's uh, feminist foreign policy, commitment to our Indigenous communities, and to the environment. Canada is notably is committed to being involved uh, with the International Partnership partnership with Nuclear Disarmament and Verification and the 2022-23 UN Group of Governmental Experts on Nuclear Disarmament and Verification. Verification uh, was one of the main concerns uh, that Canada has had with the TPNW, and we are involved in this area in, uh, in which it will be further discussed and addressed. What this means for us here today, and to end my comments as well, is that there is hope in these mentioned comments and potential connections where existing policies already exist. Finally, to activists, academics, government officials, military members, and youth. 
When it comes to nuclear weapons and disarmament, a willingness to engage with diplomacy is crucial. We said this earlier. Avoiding entrenchment and stubborn policies for hopeful engagement is a requirement for stable future. This doesn't mean everyone agrees, but that they are willing to proceed in good faith, especially when the world seems to indicate the contrary. Choose the path of hope, no matter how difficult that may seem. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Julie, um, for giving us kind of a, a historical context there and, and also showing the uh, direct and indirect uh, victims of, of, of nuclear weapons and their production and, and such uh, here at home in Canada. So we're going to um, uh, take another couple rounds of questions. Um, we already have uh, several that have been posed. So um, I'm going to pose some of those to our speakers now, and uh, I can see in real time there's more populating the chat function. Thanks so much, folks. Um, and we will uh, uh, address some of those. So um, David asked earlier, um, the hypothetical um, end of this conflict in, in Ukraine. Like we, we know that, that conflicts are not won on the battlefield. Uh, they are you know, settled at the, the bargaining table. Um, and so in, in the conclusion and the resolution of this conflict, however that looks, um, is this a place that we could see um, conversations happening about you know, how to actually move away from, from, um, from nuclear weapons, right, uh, towards nuclear abolition? Does this seem like, like, a, like a good time to move towards that? Uh, Manaz, great to see you. Thanks for coming. Manaz asks, you know, there's conversations around uh, the alternative security architectures that we should be moving towards. Do we have a good example of, of what that would look like? Um, Louise asks, uh, poses a really important point in my opinion. Um, we know that overwhelmingly the Canadian public uh, wants to see Canada sign the TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohib Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I think the number, it's something around 76% um, say objectively, yes, our government should do this. Um, so it's not um, as much an issue with um, uh, engagement, but it's it's a thing of political will, right? And and you were just saying, Julie, you know, the willingness to engage. So um, I, I think a good point is it uh, is it uh, you know you know getting our government to sign the TPNW? Um, is it as much? Is it just a, a, a an aspect of political will? I, I mean, I would say I think the answer is yes. But um, if there's any more uh, uh, thoughts on that, um, and if we could keep um, uh, keep the, the responses uh, quick, if possible, if I could ask, so we could get as many questions as, uh, in, and please uh, feel, feel free to keep posing them. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Um, perhaps I can uh, comment first quickly on, and, and then welcome Julie's comments. Um, <laughs> excellent questions, uh, all of them. So in terms of, of alternative security security arrangements, and, and I think that was from Maynas, thank you, Maynas, uh, um, and what those might look like. I think it's, um, I've often quoted this from this piece by by, by Kissinger and, and Perry and Nunn and Schultz uh, from these uh, four older sort of statesmen in the U.S. that, that for, you know, from different the walks of life, very familiar with the national security architecture, have written a couple of op-eds in the in the in the Wall Street Journal already a few years old. But one of the quotes that that that, that sends out uh, out of one of them is that, uh, and I disagree with them on many other issues. But one of the quotes uh, from uh, that I actually agree with is that that a world without nuclear weapons will not simply be today's world minus nuclear weapons. So I think uh, that you know, in terms of what those alternative security arrangements might look like, we need to remember that it's not just you know taking a. Uh, 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 pro nuclear weapons magnet, if you will, and removing, and then everything will will be okay. I, mean, I think we need to 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 consider really alternative security arrangements. We need to account for disparities in, uh, for example, disparities in conventional in conventional military capabilities. We need to consider about conflict resolution, uh, consider conflict resolution mechanisms. We need to strengthen uh, multilateral institutions. We, we need to prioritize the rule of law. Uh, countries need to engage earnestly in multilateral disarmament processes. I mean, just a lot of transformations because I, I think if nuclear abolition is to be a reality, and and um, 
and, and not to sound like a downer, but you know, it may never be. I hope it will be. I think it could be, but we don't know. If it is to be a reality, really, it is a transformation, a profound transformation in the security and the assumptions and in the security architecture that has that has underpinned global relations for the last seven decades. So, so this is this is really a, a transformation that that requires concerted thinking, etc. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll use that as a, as a as a seg into into the Canada and and the question an excellent question was asked if there's popular support you know what's what's the problem is it political uh, et cetera and uh, I think there is no political leadership for nuclear abolition. There just simply isn't, and not just in Canada. I think there is in any of the nuclear dependent or nuclear armed states. There is no leadership for nuclear abolition. There is no reasonable observer in the world, I believe, that would say, yeah, well, there are challenges, but at least we're on a path. You know, at least we have this light at the end of the tunnel. It's taking just a bit longer than we than we would like, but we're on track for abolition. I'm sorry to say there is no such thing. There's statements of good intention. There's reiteration of the fact that every state supports a world without nuclear weapons to the point that it's being rendered almost meaningless. You know, of course, that's the base. That's a, that's the foundational objective of the, of the United Nations, the, the subject of the first United Nations Security Council resolution. And so, so it's not a peacenik thing to say. You know, there's agreement in theory on that that we're moving towards a world of nuclear weapons. But I see a great lack of political leadership, and I think that's 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 central to the, the, you know, the world before us and to the juncture that we find ourselves in right now. And this constitutes uh, an opportunity for Canada. I think this is, this is something that I would emphasize. This is an opportunity that would yield, even knowing you know, potential opposition from the US or rattling, uh, ruffling some feathers, et cetera. I think objectively, it would yield benefits for Canada domestically, internationally, reputationally, in terms of strengthening the rules-based international order that we place a premium on. It would be, you know, it's an opportunity for Canada to lead. So don't I don't believe, even though there are clear technical elements to the nuclear disarmament discussion, you know, uh, strategic nuclear weapons, delivery systems, uh, 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 nuclear fusion, fission, you know, uh, all of these technical questions, even though there is a clear normative conversation, you know, about the treaty regimes, etc. Even though there are legal, relevant legal questions, compatibility between the TPNW uh, and the MPT, etc. Even though there are legitimate security questions in terms of the impact of, of nuclear uh, weapons and the faith in deterrence, et cetera. These are all valid factors. I believe with conviction that the, the, the answer or the way forward relies on to realizing that it's a political question at the end of the day and that without effective political leadership, we will not be able to tackle the valid technical, military, legal, normative questions. But it takes political leadership. And I saw a question in the chat, and I'll wrap up at this point and, and my intervention, that uh, are, are there examples of other processes or perhaps something, something, something to that effect? What we do know from other processes is that nothing happens without a clear state champion or a group of champions that has clarity of purpose, that has skin in the game, that invests resources and 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 and, and sort of a, that that puts its diplomatic apparatus to the service or of, of a certain cause for nuclear disarmament. Now we see that today in terms of of, of countries that that have you know very very valiant efforts from from Austria and 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 Ireland and Costa Rica and and and, and New Zealand and others and th that's very welcome but in terms of states that are either nuclear armed or nuclear dependent there is no political le leadership I, I i would say you know there's some positive efforts here and there but there's no clear concerted political leadership towards a world free of nuclear weapons it's a very difficult place to pick up as a response to those questions uh they're they're good questions i think um i kind of answer them all in a together so the two ones that really popped out at me were the uh what are the alternative security arrangements that exist and the afterward in moving forward and uh, afterward being uh from the ukrainian conflict 
Um, the alternative security arrangement, it's not something that is necessarily clear at this moment, uh, mainly because we exist in the current security arrangement. Um, there are places in which we can learn from other countries and we can learn from uh, current and past leaders that have been tenacious and brave in making a decision and responding and trying to resolve the situations at hand. Um, one of the, and we mentioned them already, one of the examples uh, that come from my own research uh, is, I think of is um, uh, Aiken from Ireland with the NPT. Uh, I would recommend his uh, memoir to anybody to read. And in that is a discussion of how long it took to get the NPT to come into place and the work that was required to uh, go back and forth between those that were uncertain about it, those that wanted to commit, um, both those that felt that it was uh, too weak or too strong, and it was constant back and forth. The image that is painted in the memoir is that it was almost like they were running from room to room to try and feel, figure something out. And now it's held up as a gold star treaty uh, as well. And I would say, first of all, that we need to revisit that treaty uh, with more commitment. Uh, since the last RevCon uh, had not as lot of progress that we had hoped it would. And uh, in other terms of alternative security arrangements, um, there are non-nuclear weapon states who are remarkably committed to uh, dis nuclear disarmament and a TPNW. I also think of a lot of states who um, in previous years or decades have not had a lot of uh, say or a platform in which to speak. Um, the Marshall Islands is one that comes to mind when they think about uh, their involvement. They've been extremely involved since the TPNW has come into existence with reminding people of the importance of uh, the conversation that goes beyond just uh, the use of it as a conflict weapon, uh, but also the testing sites as well. And so there's something to be learned at all levels, grassroots all the way up to the top uh, levels uh, from past and current people that are existing in countries as well. In terms of afterwards, moving forward, um, I believe that when the conflict comes to a solution, whether it be uh, momentary or long-term, that this has been the wake up call that the humanitarian and nuclear disarmament community has been trying to articulate for the last number of decades. And I believe that the, a large majority of the public, uh, we wanted to comment to ask about political will. Um, the public is required to in, encourage political will. Um, yes, there are leaders that think out of the box. There are leaders who are bold and we have a number of them, particularly in Canada who have existed uh, in the past and um, but in large part, political movement happens because the public, the voters, have made it very clear that that is what we uh, are wanting. And uh, there's a lot of noise right now in Canada about where uh, the government is being pulled. And so I would say one way to get the messaging across about nuclear weapon disarmament um, is to phrase it that all the concerns are impacted and related to the weapons. They're all connected to each other. The world is connected to each other. It's not separate aspects, it's a connected issue. And that may be a way that we can move forward. Um, I believe also, and I've said this before in other um, capacity, this may be the turning point in nuclear weapon disarmament. This may be the next chapter moving forward where we acknowledge that there needs to be a new step, that there needs to be uh, an attempt to try something different um, because we seem to have been following uh, the tried and true. And 
while there has been movement, there needs to be more. And um, I, I would like to, and I hope to live in a world in the future um, in which we feel safer in our, uh, in our future and for what it will be. Um, and that we are able to commit ourselves to all of the issues that can be at hand um, instead of being pulled in one direction or the other. Um, and it, as I said, it's gonna require the community, as I mentioned, that's activists, that's uh, academics, that's military, it's everybody. Um, it's gonna require the community to make the politicians and policymakers listen. Um, and I, I believe, I, I do believe that we can do that. And so uh, continuing to come to these kind of talks, continuing to engage in conversations such as we have today, um, and continuing to understand that, uh, as I said earlier, diplomacy has to happen and diplomacy has different variations in it, um, but agreement is not a part of, necessarily a part of that. It's the willingness to talk um, and to understand that not everybody's gonna agree on the same thing, but you still have a, semi-common goal at the end of it. Um, I believe I kind of answered the question too. Thank you, Julie. And I'm very glad you ended on that on that point about diplomacy, which 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 I can certainly and happily get behind. Uh, we've reached the end of, of, of our time of what what could uh, certainly be a longer discussion and a very fruitful discussion and and uh, and uh, uh, not least because of the very uh, pertinent comments and questions that have been posed in the chat function and in the in the Q and A function. Uh, before I wrap up, I very quickly to acknowledge a comment placed uh, recently on the chat that that uh, we don't need to have it all worked out to move towards abolition. And I, I, I just want to, there to be no ambiguity. I fully agree with that. In fact, one of the positions that we criticize of, of those that, that we consider are per perpetuating nuclear weapons is that uh, we reject any view that's, uh, that, that says that, that we need ideal international security conditions for nuclear abolition to take place because that simply will not happen. You know, there will always be challenges, including security challenges. So I think the process towards this RN needs to happen in parallel with paying attention to these uh, other situations. I want to thank Julie very much for for your for your very well informed comments and and, and reflections on these uh, thorny complex issues. It certainly made me made me you know think a bit more about the, about these issues and and, and very very uh, very concrete recommendations and, and thoughts there. The Kelsey uh, as ever uh, for for helping us run and organize the webinar and 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 being here on top of the questions and and everything. And mainly uh, all the participants for for taking the time today to pay attention to to to, to these issues for hearing us out. Uh, these are we we know these are complex uh, uh, um, uh, contexts and, and and even of some of our positions we may not have full agreement with everybody, but that's fine. I think it's important to you know to to have these conversations to think about solutions, and there seems to be a general basis about which type of scenarios we really want to avoid for the international community. Uh, thank you once again for joining and that I think with that uh, it's a wrap. Thanks again.